Telecast, the TV industry news review. Hi, I'm Justin Crosby, and welcome to this week's Telecast. On this week's show, my guests are renowned broadcaster and journalist Mark Martell and Evan Shapiro, award winning producer, professor for TV and media at NYU, and for media studies at Fordham University. Media analyst Ian Whitaker looks at the future of the TV advertising market with some surprising good news for commercial broadcasters. Career coach and wellbeing expert Tracy Forsyth talks us through how to tackle your inner critic. And Deadline's Peter White rounds up the latest formats news from Hollywood. It's all coming up on this week's Telecast. So for our main interview this week, I'm joined by Mark Mardell and Evan Shapiro. Evan is an Emmy and Peabody Award winner having produced or created more than 150 television series, specials, documentaries, and podcasts. He is a professor for TV and media at NYU Stern School of Business and for media studies at Fordham University. And Mark Martell has been at the forefront of reporting and analysing major world events for radio and TV for 25 years. As BBC TV's Newsnight's political editor, and then the chief political correspondent for the BBC's main TV and radio programmes, he reported on the huge changes in British politics, including the fall of Lady Thatcher, the rise of Euroscepticism, the formation of New Labour, and the road to the Iraq War. After the 2005 election, he became the BBC's first Europe editor, covering the birth of the Lisbon Treaty and EU politics in all its guises. In 2009, he became the BBC North America editor, reporting on the 2012 presidential election, the rise and perhaps fall of the Tea Party, and the twists and turns of Barack Obama's foreign policy. So, welcome to the show, Mark and Evan. Delighted to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks so much. Mark, coming to you first, you've just left the BBC after 30 years. What are the key changes you've seen with the BBC during your time there? And do you think the organisation is in a better state now? Oh, it has its ups and downs. It always does. It uh, goes from one thing to another. I think the changes in TV have been extraordinary. I mean, I, I, before even I started at the BBC, I worked in commercial television and uh, on a weekly show. And think of the size of the crews then, four people in a crew. And then it, it gradually got smaller as I went through my career down to the last few few jobs I was doing were clearly always with a shoot edit, which was actually, I think, a fast improvement. I mean, it was terrible for the people who lost their jobs and things like that, but it was a much better way of doing business. I think on the adverse side of thinking again about news, one of the bad things that's happened is lot too much talking heads, not, not enough reporting. I don't mean that there's no place for two ways for reporters, because clearly there is, but it's The endless standing in front of live TV, I often, I mean, I I managed as an editor not to do too much of that. But when people came to me and said, what's been happening, Mark? I felt like saying, I've no idea because I've been stuck in front of this camera all this time and I haven't been talking to anybody. (laughs) That's real journalism, isn't it? It's about going out and, and, as you say, speaking to people and investigating and, and, you know, getting responses from people. So do you think, the general state of journalism at the BBC is is in a better or worse state? I think there's a, a danger that they're ignoring the need to go out reporting. As you said, I always felt with those two ways, it's a bit like an elephant going spraying out water out from its trunk. You need to go to the lake first of all. You need to breathe in the water. You need to hold it in. And that's like going out and, and reporting. And I, I think, you know, I was thinking about when we were going, I knew we were going to talk about this, about the highlights of my career. And, you know, I've covered everything from the fall of Thatcher, which was my first big story, I guess, on TV, to uh, leaving the European Union, waking up in Brussels to find that we'd voted for Brexit. But the things that I loved doing was going out reporting, getting under the skin, whether it's Romanian shepherds knowing that they're going to join the EU and how that's going to change their standards, or in the States, the Tea Party, finding out why people think the way they do. And I think there's a danger that unless we do that, we cease to understand. I was worried about the coverage, not just, I'm not just talking about the BBC, I was worried generally about the coverage of Trump, particularly perhaps on this side of the pond, that it was just like, isn't he weird? Isn't he such a strange man? Isn't he grotesque? All of those things are true. I'm not denying that. But he's got support. There are reasons for his 
success as it, as it has been and the reason he got so as many votes as he did. Unless we understand that, we're not doing the audience uh, a decent service. Yeah. And so you, you think it was obviously not really taken seriously, but now we're, we, we've we seen that he's just had 73 million votes, which is stunning in its own uh, in, in its own right. Yeah, and really clever people can sit there and theorise in their offices. But I, I'm not that clever. I need to go out and talk to people and find out why they voted for that. Now, having, has, having this conversation with a colleague of mine is saying, you're being a bit unfair because during COVID, it's been really harsh, hard to get out. And that's true, I know. Um, but I'm just worried about the, there can be a tendency within the BBC to think the place to be is uh, in t- talking about the States in Washington uh, in talking about the European Union to be in Brussels. One of uh, an editor, a, a boss editor rather than the editor of a program once said to me, you want to be seen alongside senators. That's what people want to see. They don't want to see you talking to these people down south. Well, maybe, I don't know what people want to see. I think it's more what editors, some editors want to see alongside famous people. I was inoculated pretty early against the lure of famous and uh, well-known politicians by doing so much work at Westminster. I want to find out the real stories of real people and, and real lives. What are the key changes that have really influenced, obviously, social media, and and, and we've seen iPlayer come in in the BBC, obviously, and, and, and the general move to SVOD services and, and, and online video services. But in terms of TV news. What do you think are the key changes over the years that have really impacted uh, on on the business of news? I suppose looking back over those thirty years, it's the speed of it, the speed of getting it on the screen, and the the instant nature of it. You know, I, I remember before I went out to Europe, I was talking to one of my predecessors, and they were saying we used to be able to go off for a week, and nobody from the office would bother us because they knew we couldn't get the story in that time, couldn't get it back to them. Now you're expected every night to be on the news. And, you know, and I could say in the States I could go off on these trips because there's always a, there's always somewhere you can broadcast from. So I think there's those sort of changes. But I think, you know, we, you, you can't ignore the impact of social media on the fragmentation of the media and the desire, the difficult desire to be objective in a world which is becoming... Uh, less objective and maybe that's something we're going to talk about later on but I think that's one of the huge changes. After you left the BBC there was a report in lots of different newspapers quoting you as as talking about the current diversity drive at the BBC will annoy and dismay its loyal audience. What did you mean by that? Well that was taken from an interview on feedback on Radio 4 and it was completely distorted by the right-wing press. I did not attack diversity, I did not say that. What I said was, and I'm a great supporter of diversity, I think the BBC has to be diverse. What I was talking about was the BBC's drive to serve people who are, they see, underserved. Now, I think that's right, and and I think, you know, who are you talking about there? You're talking about younger people, and that's the main obsession of the BBC. Understandably, it needs to get younger viewers. It worries that people aren't going through, following through. It's to an extent, ethnic minorities, but that's a minor part of it, and it wasn't what I was talking about. And it's what I'll call the red wall, as the people who voted Conservative for the first time in the last election. So that they feel that all of those are undisturbed. And some people within the BBC feel that means we have to be less serious. I think that's an incredibly patronising attitude towards those people. Some people think that it means that journalism has to be about how to wear a mask and not serious issues. And that worries me, and that does worry me. So what I was saying there was that the loyal audience of Radio 4 and the 10 o'clock news who expect a decent, more than a decent, expect a sophisticated service, reporting and analysis, mustn't be ignored because they're the heart of what we do and they're the heart of what the BBC should be doing, is reporting is good journalism. Now, I mean, I don't think anybody's going to come out and say, we want bad journalism at the BBC. And they'll say that all the changes they're making are to strengthen that journalism. I'm just not convinced. Hmm. Now, a current issue the BBC is embroiled in is the investigation into Martin Bashir's alleged exploitation of Princess Diana and others to secure a 1995 Panorama interview. 
And this, for international listeners, is uh, the famous interview where Diana claimed there were three of us in this marriage, referring, of course, to Camilla Parker Bowles. Now, the allegations include falsifying documents to gain the trust of Diana and Earl Spencer. In a time when trust is crumbling in the media and we rely on public service broadcasters for the truth, this is a disaster for the BBC, isn't it? It's incredibly serious, and the new director, new-ish director, General Tim Davey, has ordered an independent investigation, which is going to be chaired by a high court judge, and I don't think you get more independent than that, and I think anybody should really feel that that's going to come up with the facts. I don't know what happened. I, I, I'm not going to prejudge it. I, I, I can't. I don't think I'd be living up to my own journalistic beliefs if I said this or that happened. I, I just simply don't know, and I'd wait for the investigation. But of course you're right. The allegation that a document was forged, and, and I think there's a bit of a red herring being, fl- uh, whatever you do with red herrings, flung. flung. <laughs> I've got horrible images of something very stinky. Um, anyway. <laughs> Whatever you do with red herrings, it's it's one to suggest there's a letter somewhere that says Princess Diana didn't wasn't persuaded by this. It's irrelevant whether she was persuaded by it. It's a question of whether the forgery exists and whether a journalist forged a document to to get a story. I mean, you can just about just about imagine circumstances when you know if you're talking about a cabinet minister or a senior politician dealing in drugs or arms trade or something like that, just about imagine that you might be persuaded as an editor to allow some sort of forgery. But for an interview like this, it would be completely unacceptable. But whether it happened or not, I don't know. But it's something that the BBC has to be absolutely straight about. And I think it's one of the things that people who, like me, love the BBC, will defend it, believe in the licence fee. We can't shilly-shally about this. It has to be you know, has to be seen to be above reproach. With a major government review into public service broadcasting in general and the whole concept of it uh, about to take place and the ongoing debate about the licence fee and how the BBC is funded, how can you see this playing out, do you think? How do you think the BBC will be funded in the future? Well, as I say, I believe in the licence fee. I think it's very good value. I think, you know, you wouldn't start from here. You wouldn't necessarily invent it now. And it is difficult. to Clearly, we leave, live in a world where people are used to paying for lots of different services, deciding to pay for them, not deciding not to pay for them. So I think it's going to be increasingly difficult. And I don't think the government's going to be feeling, particularly with the economic situation at the moment, but I think anyway, it wasn't going to uh, have a generous settlement. So I think the Director General is probably going to look as much as possible as while continuing to argue for the license fee and hoping that the license fee will continue. We'll look at funding the BBC to an extent out of sales and uh, foreign sales and things like that, and its commercial arm. It comes back to what I was talking about earlier, about the uh, drive for new audiences. I believe that news is absolutely the core and serious um, documentaries and stuff like that is absolutely the core of what the BBC does. The problem with the licence fee is that it almost literally has to be everything to everybody. Everybody has to pay the licence fee who's got a TV. So the BBC wants to say, there's something for you here, there's something for you, there's something for you. We super serve you and we serve you very well. And so it wants, it can end up looking to its competitors like a greedy kid in a school, in a, in a sweet shop who wants a taste of everything and the pies as well. It begs the question about things like, you know, should the BBC be paying, you know, huge option fees for, you know, successful foreign entertainment formats or commissioning multi-million pound, you know, lavish drama series? How do you see, do you think it could work as a, maybe a two-tier system where the news is something that comes within the licence fee and maybe there's a top-up subscription on top of that for maybe other types of premium content? I think there will be lots of people looking at some proposal like that. I mean, it is difficult what goes on subscription and what doesn't. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily be against it in principle. I'd like to keep keep the principle of the licence fee paying for everything. But maybe in the longer term, that's that's not possible. But I think it does. I mean, I was on a forum earlier today with the woman who runs BBC Local Radio, 
And I was saying, you know, because radio is so relatively cheap and yet it's being cut back, cut cut to the bone in some some distinct in some ways in local radio. You know, don't you feel like saying to the director general, Antiques Roadshow is a lovely show, it's a great show, but get rid of it and you can run local radio for years. You know, and she didn't really mm. have an answer to that. No. Because, because the BBC has a collective responsibility and, no, of course not. No, so, I mean, you're going to get people saying things like that, which... Which of those, I mean, I wouldn't say high quality drama, although you're probably right, but that's the sort of thing that would end up as subscription. I would like to see that as part of the core of what the BBC does, uh, rather than other things that are, you know, I, don't, I mean, Strictly is a great show and uh, a lot of people enjoy it, but there's no reason other broadcasters couldn't do that. The trouble is, as I say, you go back to why, well, somebody will say, well, I, I, I don't particularly care about the news, so I want to want strictly and if they're not doing that why should i pay my license fee so mm. it is a conundrum and it's going to keep coming back and i don't you know if i had an answer i'd be director general you know it is the biggest single question isn't it that we've been addre- addressing around the bbc for a number of years and it's never really moved forward there's been another license fee settlement and it's sort of the can's been kicked down the road another five years or so but there isn't an answer that's the problem there isn't yeah there isn't a decent answer mm. but i think that I mean, it is just obvious that Britain, well, I say it's obvious, but would be very much the poorer without the BBC and, and the bulk of what it does. Whether it has to do everything that it currently does, well, I doubt, frankly. Yeah. Evan, coming to you, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on Telecast. Yeah, thanks for making me follow that, by the way. <laughs> Not at all. What's brilliant about this week's show is that we've got you know two vastly experienced experts in their area so you know i can't wait to hear about your role as professor of tv at new york city university and and i know that you teach at uh, other establishments as well and and i'd love to talk about that in a second but in the meantime can you tell us a little bit about the projects that you're currently working on because obviously you're an award-winning producer as well as being an educator as well things that have most of my focus these days in addition to teaching at nyu and fordham are producing a couple of different podcasts, uh, one called Roast of Your Teenage Self, um, which has been up for about 25 weeks now. Um, And it's a really fun format where a young um, comedian named Elise Morales interviews uh, famous and almost famous people about their high school years. You know, it creates an interesting conversation about, you know, what it's like to be a teenager um, in context of, you know, today's teenagers who are, you know, really up against it in many different ways and, 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 and facing the same kinds of stressors that we did when we were all kids, but with the added, you know, gasoline of social media. Uh, and then the other podcast is, is one I'm about to go into production on. It's a scripted podcast. And it's about, uh, in New York City, there's a place called The Rubber Room, where uh, teachers who get in trouble with the Department of Education are put until their cases are, are figured out because uh, it's very difficult to, to fire a teacher who's in the union here in New York City. And they get full pay and, uh, and get weekends off and summers off and full benefits, but don't have to do anything. Um, and they can stay in these places for sometimes years. They get to go home at night, but but they get to, they have to show up to quote unquote work every day. And so it's a comedic uh, look at these places that actually exist. And it's kind of like if Orange is the new black met community. Um, so that's really fun. Developing a couple of feature films, uh, including a major feature project for Disney Plus. And you know that's that's where most of my my time goes. In addition to writing and teaching about the media. The podcasts that you you just mentioned, are you looking to develop those as as standalone podcasts, or do you want to develop those further into TV shows or uh, uh, or other types of projects, uh, depending on their success? Obviously, but is that is that your ambition to actually build the IP? And this is the first piece of the IP. Yeah, I, I very much have a point of view on IP uh, these days as you have to look at it existing in all media because if you are lucky enough to be able to build a fan base around something, that's what they expect. The, the first project I worked on, which was an adaptation from podcast into television, was now 13 years ago for with Comedy Bang Bang, which is a really great podcast to this day and was a television show that ran on IFC, which was I was running at the time for, you know, ran on 
on IFC for five years and all five seasons, I believe, are up on Netflix. I then helped adapt uh, WTF into Marin, the television show. Um, and then on since I've adapted a ton of different podcasts into TV, including Harmon Town into Harmon Quest and my brother, my brother and me. So I've long seen podcast as a really great source of IP to develop into long form premium content, but also as a terrific way to you know, develop uh, talent uh, as well. Um, and so we're really eyeing these projects as a first step in in podcasting on their way to film or television. Yeah, that's really interesting. And it was also something that uh, Ed Sayer and Michael Epstein were talking about in last week's show when we focused on uh, on podcasts. So tell us about your role as professor of TV at NYU and Fordham. You're teaching media or is it a particularly TV studies, if you like, that you're teaching personally? At, uh, at NYU, it's, it's, the, it's the business of television writ large. And at Fordham, it's the business of media and entertainment, which is a much broader topic. And I've been teaching at NYU for about eight years. And that curriculum has changed dramatically over that time. Um, and I'm now pitching executives at companies who I taught at NYU, which is fascinating. And at Fordham, I started um, from a completely different uh, point of view, which is looking at the larger media, entertainment, and technology universe, and then focusing each week on a different s- sector of it. And in both cases, I developed this map of the media universe, which I sent to you, which basically tries to portray the universe as it's evolving and the different elements of it as they you know, really collide into each other. Um, and what's what's fascinating about what Mark was just talking about, you know, the, what the BBC is going through with regards to its news division or its larger entertainment division, albeit from a different point of view, which we would here in America call socialist because it's being funded by the public, that debate over, you know, the the fee that the, the Brits pay to help BBC exist and, and it comes up, you know, every few years, is not terribly different from the debate that's going on around all commercial media here in the United States and around the world. It's just a different framing. So what I teach in in both classes currently is a kind of week-to-week tracking of three major trends. The first is the um, move from uh, in the ecosystem and media writ large from one that has traditionally been dominated almost exclusively by advertising to one that is that was at one point dual advertising and subscription fees to one that is now really a battle between advertising and subscription. The second major trend is the arrival of, if you look at the map, which I think you may post on your website, yeah. the arrival of these media technology companies which by comparison are huge death stars to the traditional media companies like Disney and Netflix. So these are Apple, Amazon, uh, Google, uh, Facebook, and Microsoft, each of which have near or greater than a trillion dollars in market value. Their arrival into the media and entertainment world has already changed and is going to greatly change its construct over the next decade um, because they have all these resources And the competition now, whether it's around advertising or around subscriptions, is really around attention. How much attention can I control um, from the public? And then the third is also something that you you and Mark were just discussing, which is this major paradigm shift from a culture dominated by boomers and Gen Z for the last 50 years to one that is now dominated by millennials or Gen Y and Gen Z. Um, and it's easy to say, oh, yes, consumers are getting younger. We have to attract them. We have to make different stuff to, 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 to attract them. Yeah, that's true. Um, but in both Europe and the United States, you know, these two generations are the most diverse generations um, that have ever lived, um, both from racial backgrounds, faith, gender fluidity, and also economic uh, diversity as well. And the other major component, which really very few people talk about, except around the kind of demographics that we have to attract, is as consumers and as employees of these major media companies, they're going to change who makes the content, how it's made, how it's distributed, how it's consumed, how it gets paid for, how it gets shared, um, and its shelf life. 
Um, and these two generations have dramatically different points of view than the two that came before it. Um, and this latest generation in, in, in the Gen Z generation, you know, because of the state of the world that we're in right now, and because they were raised from day one with iPhones in their pocket or, or, or smartphones in their pocket, are both incredibly depressed, mm -hmm. far more suicidal than any generation that's ever come before them. They see the world as, you know, burning down and they have no compunction over the idea of just burning the institutions that we hold most dear to the ground to start over from scratch. And so any conversation around media really has to focus on those three general areas. And that's that's basically the construct of, of the curriculum is rather than trying to create a curriculum and teach from it at the beginning of the this, this semester, I create a uh, an infrastructure for conversation around the changes happening because they happen so fucking fast yeah. um, that if you try to sit down a curriculum and stick to that all, all semester, you'll fall behind. So we drive a great deal of the discussion on what just happened this week. What a great way to uh, to pitch you commissioners, having uh, having been their professor at, uh, at, <laughs> at uh, uni. So I think that's a very smart strategy. You think I'd be more successful then? But yeah, <laughs> actually, the major reason I decided to start doing this, you know, because as an adjunct professor, you're not getting rich, um, is really to to understand the next generation of employees, executives, and consumers in a way that's a competitive advantage in the marketplace. That that was the major motivation. For I love the uh, the media universe map that, um, uh, that we'll be sharing alongside this on, on all our social channels. It's really fascinating. And, you know, term the Death Star when we're looking at, you know, the likes of Apple and Microsoft and all these other technology giants coming in to this space and how they are dwarfing the businesses that we've grown up with and known as being the dominant media players. It's really telling. From what you were saying about Generation Z and how they are viewing, you know, these, you know, the, the, the presumably, as you say, this sort of fairly disastrous way that they've been approaching communication. What does it tell us about the future of TV? I mean, is it too simplistic for us to say all TV is going to be short form? No. The, the, these generations love movies and, and television in, in, you know, not terribly disruptive ways, you know, that are different from previous generations. It's, it's more about the types of stories. So, you know, representation on screen, that's going to be incredibly important. Representation behind the camera is going to be incredibly important. And these are, these are consumers who will choose programming based on that. Um, then the second thing is, you know, how will you consume it? Mobile is going to continue to be incredibly important in this conversation, more and more important every year. And to your point from just a second ago, you know, the stars of these projects, um, you know, it's, it's really smart to pull people who become social media stars into these other programming forms. To, to go back to, you know, the conversation you and Mark were having around news in particular, if you focus on that, it, it is the, the method by which the, the news and information and content of all kinds is going to be consumed. Mobile is going to wind up being, if not first, then primary, meaning it, it, it's going to be the experience where most people find content first. And if they choose to then watch it on a larger screen, that's fine. But news in particular is going to come through mobile, if not exclusively, then vast majority of, of news content is going to, whether it's video or print, quote unquote, is going to come through mobile and most often through social media. So Instagram, you know, everyone's talked about Facebook. You know, Facebook also owns Instagram. Instagram has become a substantial news uh, and information platform for uh, Gen Y and Gen Z. Gen Z used TikTok to shut down President Trump's rally in Tulsa. And it's not enough to say, hey, you know, we need to understand how to use these social platforms to communicate with these generations. It's more important to say, you know, when radio and television became the primary resources for news and information, they were regulated dramatically. Like in Europe and the United States, there's a lot of regulation on what you can and cannot do on television. I would argue in some cases too much regulation. But regardless, there is regulation. You can't say fake shit on television without so, and, and, and without some kind of repercussion. 
there's just lots of regulation around it. it no, there is currently almost no regulation around news and information on social media, if not none. And that has to change. And I imagine based on what's just happened in the United States and what I think is coming in Europe, it will change. And and for the most part, for the better in the coming years. Um, but but we have to we have to spend a lot of attention on that. So no, I don't think it's going to be short form, but I do think short form matters. You know, now this is a really good news organization that is short form only. You know, news to a certain extent comes in short bursts, even you know, news programs that are, you know, if you look at every, and this is something you and Mark were just discussing, if you look at every news program in the United States, everything's called breaking news. Like that's, that's just dumb, right? That is to everything Mark just said, like it's this rush to get it on air and this rush to call everything. If everything's breaking news, then well, then nothing's breaking news. Then on top of that, almost every news organization, at least in the United States, and Mark and you were just discussing this about the BBC as well, are controlled by, or by what are ostensibly entertainment organizations. Well, that that didn't used to be the case. You know what I mean? You know, the news organizations in the United States until the eight, early 80s were news organizations. And they were separate and apart from the entertainment divisions of the same company. And there was a wall, there was a big wall between those two. That no longer exists. Um, and I think the same thing to the point you were just making, especially around the Bashir interview, says the same thing's happening in, in, in Europe and around the rest of the world as well. So that is a huge danger that I think needs to change. And I think these two generations have grown up w understanding news as entertainment and entertainment as news. And I think putting that genie back in the bottle is not going to be terribly easy. For these generations, what about trust in brands? To your point about social media and, and self-regulation, I mean, we've seen Twitter deciding to take on more responsibility, I think, uh, than many of the other social networks in terms of calling out false claims on the social media, on its platforms. Facebook, we again, this is something we touched on last week when uh, uh, Steve Bannon called for the beheading of Anthony Fauci. I mean, that that was left up on up Facebook for quite a long time. Over 200,000 people saw that content. H how, how are these generations looking at trust in media? I mean, are they looking are they looking at Twitter and Facebook as trusted brands? Or, I mean, does the BBC have any trust, even the US consumers? It's funny. The BBC probably is more trusted in the United States than it is in, in England. By those who do consume in the United States, I think it's far more trusted than, than most of the others. It's interesting. We'll get to this a little bit later when we talk about the stories of the week and, and my heroes and villains of the week. Twitter is, has been, you're right, has been the least susceptible and most responsible when it comes to certain aspects of the fake news ecosystem. It should also be noted that they're the least profitable of all those social medias. And the ones that are the most profitable are those that traffic in the fake news. And actually, you know, there's, there's a piece out today, which I posted on LinkedIn, that um, talks about how Facebook has now, you know, basically trying to grapple with hate speech and and polarizing fake news on their social platforms. And anybody listening to this who is interested in this topic should watch The Social Dilemma on Netflix because it talks about it terrifically. Hate speech, fake news, polarizing talk does better on social media than real news, regular talk, and truth. And that's why Google and Facebook are reluctant to regulate it. Uh, so the answer to your, your other question, no, I don't think anyone trusts Twitter or Facebook or YouTube. I don't think they think of them as trusted sources. Um, I think when you're on Facebook, it's the people that they get news from, like Steve Bannon, that they consider trusted or untrusted. It's brands that post on these platforms like MSNBC or CNN or Fox News that are either trusted or untrusted. And you know, there is a tremendous lack of trust amongst millennials and Gen Z for all media right now. I think deservedly so. But there's far less trust for governmental officials than there are for the media, which is interesting. I think that trust can be re-earned by both groups. Um, I think in the case of media, I think, you know, while I have my issues with the New York Times and the Washington Post, I think they've done tremendous jobs of earning the trust of consumers. I think now this is a really good 
example of a brand new trusted uh, media, especially for people who are younger. It also opens the world up to new players in this world who don't have baggage that they carry with them. So there's a uh, a new substack, I think it's called, right? That, that all these writers are, are moving to in the digital world. So Andrew Sullivan left and Glenn Greenwald left um, and a bunch of other people uh, are leaving kind of the major old school media companies and they're publishing newsletters on their own that go direct to consumer. I think you're going to see a lot more of that, both in entertainment and news. I think you're going to see you know, John Krasinski created now some good news or whatever it was called during the height of the pandemic. And he became a news source. Personality driven channels are going to be, and podcasts are a really good example of this. You know, Joe Rogan is considered a news source for a whole bunch of people. I I think that's a bad idea, but he, these personality driven publications and, and entertainment outlets will become a larger and larger sector of the media entertainment information uh, ecosystem. That's fascinating. And, and Mark, bringing you back in now, I mean, we talked about this uh, lack of trust, you know, not just falling media organizations in the UK, but it's U- US and Europe and, and Fox News. And it's right when audiences even fragmenting with talk of uh, a possible Trump streaming channel. And there's one or two different new new channels out there that uh, there's, he may be partnering with. And there's even social media apps such as Parler that are, are really having a, a, an effect in this area. Where do you see it all going? Well, listening to Evan, I felt rather depressed about where it's all going. <laughs> Brilliant analysis. Yes. Sorry. No, no, but it's, it's, it's great to hear. But, I mean, it's uh, in such depth, but it's, it's a bit depressing. I mean, I think Britain and America are so different, and, and I still think it's worth, as the BBC is trying to do, stress that it is impartial, should be objective, which doesn't mean bland, doesn't mean boring, doesn't mean we can't take a stance, but that you try, you know, you're you not driven by your own partiality, your own political preferences, to put a slant on the news. And I did find it... Um, very depressing during the election to watch the, I mean, I found it very depressing in my time in the States to watch the way that the media is fragmented into left and right, and as you say, is fragmenting even further. But I found it a little difficult to watch the stations cutting away from Trump when he was clearly saying nonsense, and you can clearly say that it's nonsense and untruthful, but he is the president. I, I wanted to see that. I wanted to be shown that. So I think that... Uh, and then you end up not trusting anybody because if you know the position they're coming from, you think, just tell me the facts. Um, now, that's very difficult to maintain, and I think the whole business of social media is, is obviously very important, and the regulation that is proposed by many people probably has to come about, and I, I think it'll be really difficult, and uh, I don't know how we're going to do it. But, I mean, I, I think that it's, it's certainly going back to the point that I think it's worth, in Britain at least, not only the BBC, but ITV and Sky and others trying to maintain that objectivity because I'm I'm not at all enamoured of the idea of people setting up a right-wing TV station or a left-wing TV station. I don't think we want to see that in this country. Um, it exists in America, of course, and you're not going to change that. But I don't think it's a good way road to go down. Well, we, we are seeing the potential uh, entry, uh, there's certainly rumoured entry into the market, isn't there, in uh, in 2021? Yeah, but I don't see how with the regulation that we've got. I mean, how does Ofcom allow that? I know that radio stations to an extent get away with it by saying, well, we've got a left-wing presenter and we've got a right-wing presenter, and that's fair enough to an extent. But I don't see how you get away with saying we are a right-wing channel, we are going to put right-wing views over, and we're not going to be objective. That is, that's not something that Ofcom should allow. I think the problem is there because of yeah. social media, there are these bubbles that have been created and, and maybe it started with Fox news and then grew out of that, but there are two different versions of the truth that are being presented. And when, when a news organization tries to prevent just the facts and then someone stands to the side and says, well, those facts are left wing. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's right. How do you I mean, address it's, that? it's very difficult. And I saw the growth of Fox alongside the growth of the Tea Party in the States. And 
people were at least, uh, and social media yeah. helped foment that as well. People saying, I'm not alone. People feel like I do about this president. People feel angry. And, then, you know, that, that sort of got that going. But how do you how do you address it? Because, you know, there are facts. There are things that are facts. I mean, I think, you know, you have to be, have to drill down into both sides and you have to give both sides a hearing. You can't just say, um, you know, take anti-vax. Now, that's that's a problem we're going to face hugely in the, in the coming months, I think, and years. Um, and it's it's up to objective broadcasters and objective people to look at the facts on both sides. You know, don't just say these people are nutters, although they may some of them may well be. But look at look at the science behind it. Talk to scientists, and you know you can't convince flat earthers that the earth isn't flat, but you can put the science for the forefront of that. Now, whether that's a liberal view, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but but that's that's the that's the thing. If there are people who will say, you know, being for a vaccine is a liberal <laughs> is a liberal view, um, you know, and that's a and that's going to be that is going to to be a, a major a major issue because you you it, while it sounds ridiculous to give flat earthers any credence. Um, it's just as ridiculous to give anti-vaxxers any credence because vaccines have saved the planet. That's not an arguable fact. And there's a real danger. I don't know how bad it is in, in, the, in the EU, but it's a real danger here that a good percentage of people aren't going to take the vaccines that have become available. And the more you yell at them that there's science behind it, the more they call you a liberal elitist. Um, and there's a long history of anti-science. You know, the anti-science movement has been a long time coming. Um, this is not new. No, it's not new. And I, I think the the BBC and organisations like it do face a difficulty here because we can say, you know, this is the example I use. There's no somebody says there's blue bananas. There's no such thing as blue bananas. It's easy enough to say that. If you get a political party that says bananas are blue. And you've got to deal with those people, and you've got to ha- have them in parliament. And you know, how do you do that? You uh, and and you know, there's there's a big argument within journalism here. Some people say you just say there are no such thing as blue bananas. You mustn't put these people on. You mustn't allow them to have their view. I feel very much we do have to explore those views, and you know, and say, sorry, bananas are green and yellow nobody's ever seen a blue banana you produce a scientist with a blue banana picture of a blue banana or tell me how that happens you know but i think you can't just dismiss people because i think it makes it well there's a danger that the they become more attractive and uh, and yeah yeah, yeah. they're suppressing me they're, they're they're banning me they're we have our first q on in congress yeah and she gets a lot of attention <laughs> And to a certain extent, I, you know, I get people who, who say to me, you know, don't, don't amplify her by pointing around. I'm like, I have to amplify her. Like she's a danger. And all, the only way to point out this danger is by pointing at it and going, that's a danger. And particularly with QAnon that you play into their hands, you know, look, the media establishment is suppressing this truth. Yep. Yeah. Mm. Well, it's it's certainly a fascinating time, and and no doubt will be over the coming years. One point I would make really quickly is that, I, and I don't know the status of this in 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 the UK, so you'll have to tell me. But we have a very, very, very poor track record of uh, media literacy in the education system in the United States, and I think if we spent more time starting in kindergarten with teaching uh, critical thinking to our young people about the messages they receive, I think we would have less susceptible citizenry for th- bullshit. That, that's my Absolutely. I mean, we, we're pretty dreadful at it as well. I think we're probably less media savvy. I don't know about literate, but I mean, yes, it should be something that's explored in schools. Yeah, I agree. So now is the time in this show for Story of the Week, where my guests get to highlight the TV industry news stories that's caught their eye in the last seven days. Evan, what's your story of the week? Uh, Wonder Woman is going to go to HBO Max, in at least in the United States. I, I can't speak for Europe, but it's going to go straight to HBO Max day and day with theaters. Um, and I think that's a, that's a major move for Warner Media, who released Tenet over Labor Day weekend to disastrous results. Um, and uh, I think a big admission that 
the paradigm shift around blockbuster films, not just within the pandemic, is going to change. Yeah. And so you think windowing is changed forever now? Yes. Interesting. I do. Mark, what's your story of the week? Well, I think the news story of the week has to be the number of vaccines that are coming through and seem to be effective and just the glimmer of hope that life could start to return to normal, including TV life um, next spring. And uh, I was going to say, when I was first thinking about this, nobody can be against it. But as we've just pointed out, some people will be against it, but not saying ones. Well, interestingly, on that point, I did see last week, I think it was uh, Ticketmaster that were rumoured to be only planning on en- entry into a- events, mass events, with people that can prove that they're, uh, they've been vaccinated. You know, maybe when there's a benefit, then people may weigh up the benefits of uh, being vaccinated. Yeah. I think if you have to have a vaccine to see Taylor Swift, you will get a vaccine. Yeah. <laughs> and finally, it's time for my guests to nominate their hero of the week and who or what they want to tell to get in the bin. Mark, who's your hero of the week? Obama for a brilliant interviews on TV and also in the Atlantic, uh, reminding us what a thinking politician is like. And whilst obviously partisan in many ways, just going across the piece in such a broad and intellectual way, talking about why he believes the arc of history bends towards justice. And one thing that I think was relevant to our discussion that he said about the way that he used to go to a small town and find the newspaper editor would be wearing a bow tie and have a crew cut, and you knew he was a Republican, but he'd give you a fair listen and put something in the paper and would basically say, this guy's a Chicago liberal, but listen to what he's got to say. Now all you find is right-wing websites that don't tell the truth and wouldn't give you a fair hearing. So the, his, his take on the way the media landscape has changed. Yeah. The Obama era and uh, John McCain era feels like a long time ago, doesn't it? Yeah. Evan, who's your hero of the week? I would have said Obama too, but Mark beat me to it. Um, I think it, this is going to be very difficult for me to say out loud uh, and on the record. Um, but my hero of the week is Tucker Carlson. I, it pains me to just say the words. But against all odds, he went on television this week and called out the the um, bullshit uh, amplifier um, that is Sidney Powell for her crazy town uh, conspiracy theories around the election here and really was the reason I think she got fired uh, by Trump and the reason why Trump eventually, you know, kind of got to the other side of of this. He's still claiming ridiculous things here, but he really did galvanize the right in the United States around the idea like, hey, this is cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. You have to stop doing it. And he got a lot of backlash in the uh, in the uh, conservative circles because of it and from 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 MAGA followers in the United States. So I, 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 I don't like Tucker Carlson. I disagree with everything that comes out of his mouth usually, but he went against the 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 cult this week and and did a very good thing in calling crazy conspiracy theories for what they are. Okay. And Evan, who or what are you telling to get in the bin? Um going back to the conversation around the news organizations, um I, I'm telling Jonah Peretti, who is the CEO of uh BuzzFeed um and now who just bought Huffington Post to get in the bin because he made this odd claim that the only good news moving forward will be free. And that paying for news makes it bad. Um, and I think, you know, whether you talk about the BBC, which is paid for by taxes of the British public, or you talk about the New York Times or the Washington Post here, we can clearly see that that isn't true. And when he says free, he means ad supported. And I think one of the greatest dangers uh, about news right now is the need to get clicks so that you can create impressions so that you can sell ads. So I think Jonah deserves to go in the bin. And Mark, who's going in your bin? Critics of the Crown for making stuff up. It's a fiction. It's a drama. Of course they've made (laughs) stuff up. I mean, I would agree with them if they were saying that Prince Charles had an affair with Arthur Scargill or the Queen rode the winning horse at the Derby. But they're making up conversations that quite possibly could have taken place. There's no way anybody can know except the participants. Of course, the dramas, you're going to make things up. It's a ridiculous argument. Hmm. Do you think dramas should be uh, should, there should be a, uh, a a warning or a note at the beginning of dramas just to say this is fictional when they're depicting true events from the past in a in a dramatic way? 
Well, they probably have something at the end, but it goes back to what Evan says about media literacy, that you need people to realise that they are watching a fiction. I mean, you know, I mean, I think I, I think things should be well researched. I think they should stick to the historical truth as much as they can. But people surely must realise, should realise that they nobody's, you know, taken a note of those conversations between the Queen and Prince Charles. You know, of course, nobody knows what's going on. So, And the same goes for political dramas. Of course, much of it's going to be uh, made up. And I mean, I'm not saying it should be just totally fantasy. But um, are, are you trying to tell me that Caesar didn't say a tu brute? Yeah, I mean, Shakespeare's sh- dreadful, isn't it? Shocking. Shocking. <laughs> Fake news from Shakespeare. Fake news. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, Mark and Evan, thank you so much for joining me this week. It's been a really fascinating conversation. I look forward to uh, to hearing uh, what the listeners have got to say about it. Uh, which they can do, obviously, via our uh, our LinkedIn group or uh, any of the social media that we're going to be sharing the show. And also in the uh, description of the podcast, we're going to put a load of links to both stories and podcasts of Evans and uh, lots of different information in the description so you can uh, you can read information about those further. So, again, Mark Evan, thank you so much for coming on the show. I hope you stay well, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in real life very soon. Thank you. It's been a great pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Now, as we know, the TV advertising market cratered in 2020, despite record viewing figures for many broadcasters. And ITV, for example, reported a fall of 43% in advertising in the second quarter. And many were sounding the death knell for commercial broadcasters in, in many parts of the world as we approached the second lockdown as their business models came under threat with traditional advertisers holding on to their budgets in the key Q4 period. However, we've recently seen signs of advertising bouncing back, albeit to lower levels than before, and it seems marketeers are finally loosening those purse strings, which of course has a big knock-on effect for commissioning and content creation in the TV industry. So this week, I'm joined by twice winner of City AM Analyst of the Year Award, Ian Whitaker who's Managing Director of Liberty Sky Advisors and a leading city media analyst for 20 years. And he's got some thoughts on some more potential light at the end of the tunnel for commercial broadcasters from perhaps an unexpected area. Ian, welcome to the show. Talk us through your thoughts on the future for TV advertising. Well, thanks very much for that, Justin. Uh, It's great to be on. I'm actually quite bullish about advertising over the medium term. For a start, there are signs firms are shifting budgets from areas that are seen as structurally small and moving forward. So, for example, travel and entertainment. I think in the future, property will also fall in that camp as well. And I'm actually moving that into advertising. You've also got another factor here, which is the increasing number of DTC firms. And that's likely to boost advertising spending as firms fight the share. And you can see that in areas such as streaming, for example. However, perhaps a key, if not the key driver, will be e-commerce. Now, a permanent feature of the pandemic will almost certainly be a structural step up significantly in the size of the e-commerce market. E-commerce has moved centre stage to retailer strategy in a far more sudden and dramatic fashion than expected. If you look at the major supermarket chains as well as other re- retailers, they have moved e-commerce to the heart of their company strategies. Now, on one level, that now means that Amazon faces far more competition at this stage than it would have imagined. Uh, And you can see that in terms of some of the growth rates sort of with Amazon compared with some of the other retailers. So if, for example, you take sort of in the midst of the pandemic, you saw retailers step up to the plate here. E-commerce grew 97% in Q2 at Walmart and was the main contributor to the comparable sales growth of 9.3%, and it provided two-thirds of that growth that came through. If you look at Target in the US, they saw e-commerce sales rise 195%. If you look at Best Buy, their online revenues grew 242% year-on-year. It is now over half of their domestic US revenues versus 16% in the second quarter of 2019. Compare that with Amazon's growth, which is around 40%. Now, that story is continued into Q3, with the retailers showing much faster growth generally than Amazon. It is true, of course, that they are starting from a much smaller base. But Amazon's share is not so dominant as to the future threats. If you look in 2019, 
Amazon had an estimated 37% share of the U.S. retail e-commerce market, which was over six times more market share than the number two player, but not a share that locks in the overwhelming network effects that would mean that its position would be unchallengeable. However, I think it's not just Amazon here who's at risk from the growth of e-commerce at, at the retailers. It also has worrying implications for a number of brands, particularly in the FMCG side. And if you think about it, when a shopper goes to a store, brands benefit from customers' recall of products and the values associated with them. Yeah, this has been built up over time. And the retailers obviously have some control sort of uh, uh, from their part. And this is why child placement is such an important issue, uh, because where a product is placed obviously has an impact on, on whether it sells or not. However, a consumer that's walking around can literally take in hundreds of products as they shop. And if they recall the brands, sort of who have advertised over the years, then that means that brands do have a good amount of capital that they can draw upon. However, major retailers such as Walmart see more of their sales move online, then a great percentage of the brand sales are going to come from an environment where retailers have a lot more control over which brands are seen or not. And this is particularly relevant if brands are competing against the retailer's own label, which they are in many cases. Yeah, looking at, for example, what's happening in the US, but you will also see it in the UK as well. You've got brands, sort of the main supermarket brands, talking about how they want to grow the sales of their own label products that are within the next two to three years. If they do so, then that share is likely to come from those of the, the, the brands themselves. And therefore, for brands, what they need to do is defend against themselves. And the main effective way they can do this is really through brand advertising. Now, sort of as well as e-commerce, what will be particularly problematic is if you get the concept of Q-commerce taken off. Now, this is an idea that's been flagged by Delivery Hero, which is one of the main global food delivery companies. And their view is consumers picking from a small selection of curated brands held in a series of small warehouse style locations dotted around urban areas where delivery drivers deliver the products in less than an hour. Now, if that does take off, if Q-commerce does take off, then the threat to brands and particularly smaller brands is abundantly clear. If only a small selection of products is available, then many brands are likely to be squeezed out of the equation. It will become survival of the fittest. So from that standpoint, that's a, a, a sort of major threat. Now, there is an argument to say that one positive for the brands is that Q-commerce is more likely to be aimed at single-person households, uh, not families, that's fine as far as it goes, but it's really small comfort. So how do brands actually protect themselves against this trend? Well, sort of mentioned it before, the obvious answer is really to advertise, to boost sales and brand. What brands should be considering now is to boost their advertising spend so that if e-commerce grows even more rapidly and Q-commerce does take off, then these brands are in a better position to be one of the chosen brands that consumers go for. Yeah, there are more radical solutions that advertisers could look at. They could look at setting up D2C outlets, although that obviously has a number of implications in terms of how consumers shop and also as well the brand effectively competing the retailer. They could, of course, set up and promote their own e-commerce operations as well more effectively. But quite frankly, the easiest, the simplest, the quickest, and probably the most effective way for many of these brands to actually deal with the changing environment will be to advertise and to advertise more effectively. And when you look at broadcasting and TV, time and time again, the surveys have shown that TV is the most effective medium in terms of promoting brand. And while sort of, of there has been the, the view that over the years sort of, of TV, how much relevance it has, particularly for a younger audience, what the pandemic has shown is that people do still have resonance sort of an affinity with TV, and moving forwards, the broadcasters growing AVOD revenues will also help as well to grab a growing share of the digital advertising pie. That's fascinating stuff, Ian. And it could be the fight back for commercial broadcasters that they've all been uh, waiting for. I think that's very much the case. I, I think, you know, again, there's a number of positives, I, I think, here from the broadcasters, bizarrely enough, from this pandemic. Yeah, even though short-term advertising has been here, I think one of the things that the pandemic has shown is that television is still a very important medium to people. One of the, the 
if not the biggest unspoken barrier that TV advertisers have had, at least in the market such as the UK, is the perception amongst decision makers that linear TV just isn't really that effective anymore. And audiences sort of are moving away from it. Put quite bluntly, the people who make advertising decisions, who are really sort of are in a decision to dictate where advertising money goes, are not really the sort of people who watch Coronation Street or Emmerdale five or six times a week. But you look at those programs, they deliver six, six and a half million plus audiences consistently throughout the year. So I think that's been a major, it's a word, you want to call it breakthrough for the broadcasters from this pandemic. Obviously, there's been the benefit that's come through in terms of, of the audiences, but also as well, again, you look at the the growing number of brands who are, have realised that TV, the pricing going down, particularly given the, the state of the UK advertising market and how it's structured, and now a new entrance to the TV market and have realised that it worked very, very effectively. So I think one important point to emphasise moving forwards is we should probably get out of the, the view of seeing the likes of ITV as television broadcasters and think about them more as video broadcasters. And the reason why I emphasise that is that increasingly the platform will become increasingly irrelevant so that ITV can display its content or any broadcaster can display its content, both in terms of, of your traditional TV format, but also as well in terms of online and mobile. And obviously, possible positive implications as well for content creators, more shows getting commissioned, hopefully, and you know, giving the industry the opportunity to fight back in 2021. So that's something that I'm sure we're all looking for. Ian, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Really fascinating look and a reminder of how the TV industry doesn't sit on its own. Obviously, you know, e-commerce and advertisers and FMCG brands, et cetera have you know major impact all the way down the chain through to production so uh thank you again for coming on the show and hopefully you'll come on the show again soon not at all thank you very much and now after a few weeks off i'm delighted to welcome back to telecast peter white from deadline peter how are you how's la post-election i'm good justin hello mate um yes uh, yeah i have spoken to you in a, a few weeks uh, obviously been celebrating uh the president-elect, Joe Biden, uh, there definitely feels like uh, a bit more optimism in this city uh, since that, uh, helped by some uh, some decent vaccine news. So hopefully uh, 2021 will be slightly better than 2020. Well, it can't get any worse, can it? Let's face it. <laughs> no. So what's the TV industry been up to over the last few weeks in LA? The last few weeks, uh, what do we remind about? Largely, the three things that we've been focusing on are, uh, no surprise, COVID-19. We're writing a lot about production, how that's getting back and occasionally uh, halting. Uh, there's obviously a lot of layoffs and restructures still going on. Uh, the big companies like NBC Universal and Warner Media uh, are sort of moving their teams around and shifting things, getting rid of people and promoting others, um, which largely builds into the other one, which is streaming. Um, you know, they're doing this largely on the whole uh, to focus on on their streaming services uh, rather than their linear network so uh, so those are the sort of three uh, three main topics that are taking up uh, most of my day yeah and i gather there's been quite a bit of movement in the format space as well yeah so uh, we've got some interesting uh, interesting formats uh, the unscripted business has you know become even more important i think over the last last few months uh, for a few reasons you know no surprise, it's cheaper to produce, so uh, a lot of these companies are, are, are doing a little bit more of it, or certainly seems that way, um, and slightly easier to produce in these times. And, uh, you know, the scripted shows have, have sort of been uh, having to sort of stop and start production, whereas uh, many of these uh, non-scripted entertainment formats are having a little bit more success in uh, in getting seasons produced. So, uh, so yeah, and, and then from an international point of view, uh, what I thought was interesting this week was uh, Fox doing a, a remake of Game of Talents, which is a, a Spanish format uh, done by Fremantle. Uh, and it's something you don't often see. You certainly don't see Spanish formats, entertainment formats, traveling uh, to the States. Mm. Um, it's been a while in the works. I think a lot of other broadcasters internationally are also doing it. Um, 
and uh, you know it's a media set show which you know a, a country largely known as a an importer of formats rather than exporters so they're doing you know it's essentially a, a mystery format and fox loves these these mystery sort of hidden talent shows they've got uh, they've got the masked singer obviously they've got a spin off of that the masked dancer and i can see a voice uh, they also just announced name that tune so uh, they uh, they really like uh, a little bit of mystery does uh, does fox so yeah i think that will also give um, give international producers, international formats people uh, some confidence that uh, the networks are still taking, you know, shows from abroad. And and I think that's uh, that's going to be something that uh, will continue. It's, you know, it's nothing new, but, uh, but always good to see. Hmm. And I gather there's some movement for one of the formats that we highlighted, it feels like a long time ago, earlier, uh, earlier in the year, maybe it was late spring, early summer, when we were talking about the Container Cup, which was a Belgian TV format. I gather there's some movement around that in the States. Yeah, this is your favourite Belgian format, isn't it, Justin? It is. Um, and it's uh, it's in development at TBS. Uh, we did a, a profile of Reinout Orlemans, who um, many people internationally will know as the, as the founder of iWorks, and he built that up and, and sold it for a, a quite a lot of money to Warner Brothers. Uh, and he now runs 3Ball in the, in the US, a uh, production company, uh, largely focusing on uh, on scripted formats, so yeah, he's uh, he's managed to get that into development with TBS. It was interesting what he was saying. Uh, you know, they're they're going to do it COVID proof because obviously uh, the format exists in a way in which uh, you can do that. But he's also kind of keen that it doesn't just um, you know become one of those slightly naff shows that uh, that looks like it was uh, it was done because of the the pandemic. Yeah, he's talking about big talent. You know, would like to get uh, really big A listers to to compete. In that, so yeah, I think uh, you know certainly something that they're doing stuff up, and you know again another international format landing at US, Network, which is yeah. which is great, and, and they're also the company that are, are behind um, Come Dance with Me, which is a, a new CBS show with uh, exec produced by LL Cool J and and Chris O'Donnell. So they're they're having some success. He's sort of recently taken on this chief creative officer role as well as chairman. So uh, so yeah, interesting developments on on that side from the from the formats world. The Container Cup seemed like, at the time, the perfect lockdown format. With that comes, obviously, as you say, you know, a shelf life. But presumably, you know, if if uh, TBS is uh, is now developing that, they are thinking about that being something that can run and run. It doesn't just mean COVID. That's the thing, because look, we don't know when we're going to get out of this. And what you don't want is... Is a bunch of shows being made that that looked like they were they were sort of pandemic telly, and and you can actually you know the, the show could have existed well outside of of the pandemic. You know, you put up these two two big crates in front of people's houses or wherever you put them. Um, you know, I don't know, stick it outside Mark Wahlberg's house, and, and and you know, does that is that pandemic programming? I mean, it's pandemic pandemic safe to a certain extent, but uh, but you can do it mm-hmm. at any time, and I think that's the hope because what they don't want and 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 the networks here as well as a number of other countries uh, you know did these did these shows at the top which were largely sort of filmed over zoom and they looked a bit cheap they looked a bit naff and people were sort of sick of of watching them really so i think what they need now is that next step you know before we get back to the full scale audiences and and, and these big entertainment shows uh, in a normal way is something in between and and i think you know something like the container cup could certainly could certainly be that. Uh, it, it, right now, I uh, certainly hope so. And, and Corey Henson, who runs TBS, does as well. We'll keep that very closely under observation, Peter. Bring us any news you hear of, of those developments in that area when you can. Thank you so much for joining us again. And stay safe out there in LA. And we'll speak to you very soon. Thanks a lot. And now it's time to catch up with our resident wellbeing expert and career coach, Tracy Forsyth. Tracy, how are you? I'm well, thank you, Justin. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. I, uh, I've i been doing my stretches, Aldesco stretches. Oh, fantastic. So your shoulders are nice and open, you're sitting up nice and tall, and you're using your breath to feel powerfully calm, are you? Yeah, you know, what I found was really useful with it was when you're moving around the house and working in different workstations, and, you know, you've got a seat and a desk and your laptop at a different heights at each one. So it's really good to spend a few minutes thinking about those things yeah. um, as you uh, as you move around the house, as we all <laughs> need to, to go somewhere quiet yeah. uh, and get some work done. So, yeah. uh, so thank you for those. So this week, I gather you're going to be talking about inner critic. 
Yes, I'm going to be talking about inner critics because so many of my coaching clients ask me about how to deal with their inner critic, this persistent voice inside our head that that brings us down, that that puts us in our place, makes us feel worthless. I mean, everybody's got an inner critic. And often people sort of believe them. And so today I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about inner critics, how what they are, what they do, and how to really tackle them. If this resonates with you, if you have some the voices in your head or um, or feelings that that stop you in your tracks by telling telling you you're stupid or that you won't achieve something or you're not enough or whatever it is you're going for, then this is what I'm loosely calling an inner critic. So I think it's like a lot of the times I look to the animal kingdom uh, for wisdom um, and everything. And and, and inner critics, um, I think, are sort of like persistent mosquitoes. You know, we swap them away, but they keep coming back. And, you know, the question is, why do we have them? You know, in the animal kingdom, you can't imagine a lion or tiger doubting whether or not they should go in for the kill. And a gazelle probably doesn't think, hmm, I don't think I'm skilled enough to make that leap. But animals, of course, do have high, highly honed instincts through their senses about danger. So they do sense danger and they go to great lengths to avoid it. And so in the same way that I think that inner critics are, are not necessarily there because they want us to feel bad or low about ourselves, but because like those sort of like um, instincts, they are trying to protect us in some way from danger you know, often I think an inner critic is is just like an overreactive helicopter parent trying to stop you from harming yourself. So, for example, your inner critic might say to you, you are not qualified for that job, so don't even attempt it. And what it might mean is actually, I don't want you to get upset if you don't get what you want. So I'd rather you just didn't try and put me through all the hassle. Another example is, you know, an inner critic saying, oh, don't say anything, don't say anything, don't speak out, you'd be really stupid to say anything. And what it probably means is, you know, it's just not worth taking the risk of making a fuss because what happens if people don't agree with you? Another one, I think, is like, um, this is often what happens, an inner critic might say, you're in the wrong and everyone else is right. So, you know, just pipe down. And, you know, if we think about it, what, what's it trying to protect us from? It, it might be saying, you know, I just don't want you to be different. Just stick with everybody else and go with the flow. Don't stick your neck out and nothing, no harm will come to you. So in one sense, I think inner critics are often trying to stop us from taking risks, saving us from ridicule, trying to keep us safe because they worry that we'll come to harm. But the issue is that that like an overbearing parent who loves us and wants wants to wrap us up in cotton wool, they're essentially keeping us small, cooped up, unable to dare or learn and grow. So if that resonates with you and you've got inner critics like that, then what are some practical steps that you can take to tackle them? Okay, so I think one really good tip is to treat them like an elderly relative who loves you. So, you know, we've all got that person well, most of us have that person in our family. It might be an old auntie. Um, it might be, you know, a grandfather type figure, some sort of elderly relative that is 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 always sort of like worried about us. So the next time you find yourself in negative self-talk, I want you to, to try this. Just stop, stop and take stock. Listen as if you were indulging an elderly, somewhat old fashioned relative. So really examine what it is that they're saying and why. What is it that they're trying to protect you from? So listen and then try if you can to show that thought or intention some compassion. So imagine it's coming from a loving place. You know, do they have any point at all? And how could you allay their fears for you? So, for example, if I look at those things that we said before, the inner critic says, oh, you're not qualified for that job, so don't even attempt it, meaning I don't want you to get upset if you don't get what you want. So your answer back might be, I understand that you're worried that I will get upset and I appreciate your concern, but I have worked very hard for this promotion or opportunity and I'm qualified in this way and that. And if I don't try, I won't ever know if I could do it or not. So, you know, it's really sort of like, 
talking to them as if it was an elderly relative that that was just being a bit overbearing. So reason with them and try to allay their fears. Second thing I think is really, really helpful is to personify your inner critic. So give them a name, give them a look, almost like, um, you know, create a police lineup of your inner critics. So if you identify all of your inner critics, write down what they say, um, see whether it's the same inner critic or whether it's a different critic that pops up from different circumstances. Give them a name, imagine what they look like, how they're dressed, what they sound like. So For example, when I was starting out my new business, um, you know, I'd come from a big uh, position at BBC Worldwide. And then I was starting out on my own, my own company, starting completely from scratch. You know, my inner critic was um, a woman. It was probably me, but with greasy hair, wearing an old slobby tracksuit and um, sitting on the sofa, drinking tea and dunking biscuits all day, every day, you know, right at the corner of the the sofa. And she'd be looking over at me saying, you'll never earn any money out of that. So I don't know why you bother. You know, you just might as well pack Mm -hmm. it in. You're never going to be successful. So if she'd had her way, she she would have had me give up and, and not try. And when I really think about that, you know, um, what I think is that, 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 Often an inner critic is um, representing a, a value that you hold dear. So, for, for example, for me, that kind of um, that, that version of me on the sofa uh, um, was a value that um, had been greatly overplayed. So one of the things that I really care about is financial um, stability don't we all in the free freelance mm-hmm. world? So this is going to be a common one. So I hate to feel out of control with my finances because it means that I'm not going to be independent and it's going to curtail my freedom. So what I really realized is that when my inner critic was saying, don't bother, it's going to be too hard. She was really, it was a part of me that was wanting to shout, I'm really worried about finan- financial security. I'm worried about not being able to put food on the table and pay the bills. You know, what happens if we uh, end up with no money? Sort of alert, alert. But the, uh, and that is a very real issue. But if I'd really let that inner critic bring me down, I would never have even tried. So, you know, uh, um, so by kind of like understanding, actually, yes, financial earning money is very important to me because I've got to we've got to live. But that's what that is about. So it's not worth not trying just because you're worried about not earning money, if you know what I mean. So so that's my other tip is to really ask yourself, what is your inner critic really related to a value that you hold dear gone to an extreme extreme so one of the ones that many people in our industry have is a perfectionist inner critic that nothing they ever do is good enough and that's because most people in this industry are um really overachievers who who care about excellence and uh, a sort of comp- you know there's always competition so you have to be really fantastic at your role um to carry on so but 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 overplayed it gets to be perfectionism where nothing is ever good enough and you never celebrate any of your achievements once you've done them and um so next time you're beating yourself up about something just ask hang on a minute you know is this fair is this right is this just my my excellence value being overplayed to the point of perfectionism one of the things that I think um, I just wanted to sort of say that the, the 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 other tip I have about sort of inner critics is truly try to see yourselves through other people's eyes. So, you know, one of the steps to getting getting to grips with your inner critic and never negative self-talk is to start believing the good things people say about you and all the compliments that you receive. And it's not easy because it's human nature to ignore the nine lovely things you're told and focus entirely on the one piece of criticism that you get and beat yourself up about it. So we Mm -hmm. tend to have a laser-like focus on what, what isn't right instead of enjoying all the things that are. But the next time somebody compliments you at work, or wherever, try truly accepting it and believing it. Accept that the version of you that they see is real. So one practical way of continuing this is to get some really honest feedback from colleagues or friends about how they see you. Ask them to describe you in one word. You could do this through one of those survey monkeys, if you like, if you could do it anonymously, if you're squeamish. Um, 
you or they are squeamish about doing it. But most people are happy to give you feedback. So collate that list of words and stand up either in the privacy of your own home or in, or, or in front of the mirror and say, I am, and then each of the words. So it might be, I am generous, I am empowering, I am wise, I am smart, etc. So if you've asked them to be truly honest, those friends, then accept that this is a true description of who you are to them. And the next time your inner critic has a go, use that evidence to clap back at them. Fantastic. Tracy, that's that's great. Visualization and taking a compliment are probably two of the two of the things that, that perhaps we don't think about doing too much, but that's uh, fantastic advice. Good. I hope it helps. Thank you very much. Tracy, great to have you on the show again, and we look forward to hearing more from you next week. Brilliant. I'll be here. Well, that's about it for another week's show. As always, thanks for listening. I really hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to rate and subscribe to the show and share it with friends and colleagues. We're starting a new free newsletter called Telecast Plus on December the 4th. We aim to make it the most useful thing coming into your inbox every Friday. It'll be packed with interesting TV industry stories of the week you might have missed, jobs news, execs available for hire, Tracy's tip of the week, and more insight and opinion you can shake a stick at. And all completely free. Just visit our website to sign up at telecast-podcast.com. That's telecast-podcast.com. Telecast was edited by Ian Chambers and recorded in isolation in Ilkley, West Yorkshire. So, until next Thursday, as always, stay safe.